So hello, my name is David Salman from Moffitt Cancer Center, and I'd like to thank the organizers for asking me to speak today. So this is a very broad topic, Let me see. There we go. Um, which could be a focus of a whole several day presentation, but I want to focus on three items. Uh, first, to do an overview on the molecular landscape of MDS. Next, to focus on the genetic drivers of prognosis and how they relate to outcomes, with a particular focus on p53 mutations. And then lastly, I'd like to highlight some recent work that this is not a static marker, but it's really a dynamic marker over time that gives clinical insight into the patient's disease. So work by multiple groups has really comprehensively characterized the mutational spectrum of patients with MDS, where we can identify mutations in approximately 80 to 90 percent of patients with some uh, genotype-phenotype correlations. And there are, are mutations involved in multiple pathways. I think this figure you know, kind of highlights nicely. The size of the circle uh, represents the uh, frequency of mutations. So you can see that splicing factors and ep uh, mutations of epigenetic dysregulation are by far the most frequent mutations. But there are also mutations involved in tyrosine kinase pathways, transcription factors, and others. So first, to take a focus on uh, spliceosome mutations, I think elegant work you know, published back in 2011 showed that really these mutations are, are highly concordant <clears throat> with the pathogenesis of the disease. So the mutations predominantly affect the three prime uh, 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 splicing sites where uh, effects uh, both uh, uh, taking out uh, introns and, and uh, putting exons together. And I think what was uh, striking very early on is that patients that had SF3B1 mutations was highly concordant with having the presence of ring sideroblasts. And then in CMML, uh, about half of patients have a spliceosome mutations as well, uh, with SRSF2 uh, representing the most common mutation in that cohort. So to dive into a little bit more with SF3B1, this really uh, defines a molecular and clinical subgroup with a relative indolent prognosis. So you can see across the top that, again, SF3B1 is strikingly con concordant with the presence of ring sideroblast with rare patients not having the mutation. And Malkovati had looked at this and looked at the allele burden of SF3B1. And indeed, only patients that have a lower VAF are the patients that sometimes will have ring sideroblasts less than 15%, which is uh, of diagnostic relevance. We've looked at this as well. So the bar graph on the left shows a distribution of a large number of cases uh, with the uh, VAF. And we also see that patients that have a higher allele burden of SF3B1, again, predicts for a percentage of bone marrow ring sideroblasts with the two patients that had no increase in ring sideroblasts, again, having a low VAF. So how does this affect diagnosis? So really, up until the recent revision of the WHO, uh, sequencing was not involved at all. And so now it has started to, has started to become that. So the figure on the left you know, clearly shows you know, greater than 15% ring sideroblasts. So this would have been a diagnosis of RAR. S, but whereas patients that would have only that have less than 15% ring sideroblasts would have been previously class, classified as idiopathic cytopenia of undetermined significance, now if they have the presence of SF3B1 mutation are classified um, as having ring sideroblasts. This is just a table showing the the. Um, 2016 update where you can see that, again, if you're greater than 5% uh, but have the presence of SF3B1 mutation, you're now classified as MDS with ring sideroblasts. So do co-mutations matter as far as genotype-phenotype correlations? And what this study showed that if you had co-mutation of TET2 in either SRSF2 or ZRSR, ZRSR2, it was uh, very concordant with the presence of monocytosis, actually 97% in this study, where the few patients that did not have CMML, actually two out of the four of them developed overt CMML over the course of the study. So we've looked at this well. So when we look at patients that have this commutation and then look at the allele burden of SRSF2, indeed patients that have a higher VAF of SRSF2 um, predicts for the presence of monocytosis being greater than 1,000, the median VAF being significantly higher in patients with monocytosis, as well as on the bottom, the absolute monocyte count uh, uh, being predicted by the uh, VAF of SRSF2. We tried to look at this with ZRSR2, um, which is a relatively rare uh, commutation combination. And although there's a trend uh, uh, for higher VAF in patients with monocytosis, this wasn't significant, but this is likely a numbers factor. So I think we can clearly see, at least especially with spliceosome mutations, that this can uh, predict for the phenotype of these patients. But how does this affect prognosis? 
I think all of us uh, you know, have you know, seen this public, a pivotal publication back in 2011 where mutations in one of five genes, in particular P53, EZH2, ETV6, RUNX1, or ASXL1, predicted in multivariable analysis for inferior outcomes. But more importantly, if you look at clinical prognostic scoring systems, essentially having the presence of one of these mutations essentially upstaged. So somebody who's low risk that has one of these mutations has a prognosis similar to somebody who's intermediate risk. So we've been part of a large collaboration um, uh, 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 with the IWGPM group, and we now have data of over 3,500 patients who have sequencing um, and have been clinically annotated at time of sampling with about a 3.6 year follow-up. And I think we see a couple of things. So previous work has shown that indeed the number of mutations is predictive both for leukemia-free as well as overall survival. So we have looked at this um, as well. And indeed, the presence of each additional mutation predicts for uh, in poor outcomes. Again, some of the, several of these slides you'll see are courtesy of uh, Raf Bahar. And there's lots of data on different genes having different prognostic importance. So when the data that we presented at ASH in 2015, presence of P53, Siebel, EZH2, RUNX1, UTF1, or ASXL1 predicted for poor outcomes independent of clinical prognostic models, whereas the presence of a mutation of SF3B1 in the absence of one of these adverse uh, markers predicted for improved outcomes. So you can see the gene set has sort of already changed from that original publication back in 2011. And to sort of add an additional level of complexity when we look at this, so this is looking at hazard ratios of each individual mutation based on their percentage of bone marrow blast. So in patients with increased blast, you know, clearly P53 is very significant with a high hazard ratio. But you know, some of the genes, for example, ASXL1, if you look at the circle on the bottom, really has no prognostic relevance in this data set. Whereas if we look at patients with lower blast, again, SF3B1 has a lower hazard ratio as we would expect from multiple studies. But now you can see where ASXL1, you know, RUNX1, and several of the splicing factors are now prognostically relevant. So if we look at uh, another setting as far as complex karyotype, is all complex karyotype created equal? And I think the answer is no. So this is data of almost 300 patients out of complex karyotype. And then trying to see, can we further stratify these patients? So in univariate analysis, having a monosomal karyotype, having five abnormalities versus three or four, or having the presence of P53 mutation predicted for poor outcomes. But in multivariable analysis, only having more than five abnormalities or having the presence of P53 mutation predicted for inferior outcomes. And I think the survival curve kind of highlights this nicely. And I think as expected, P53 mutation predicts for a very dismal uh, survival of only, you know, anywhere from six to 12 months in studies. But if patients did not have P53 and only had three or four abnormalities, their median overall survival in this large cohort was 34 months. So we've looked at P53 in detail, especially in particular with the clonal burden. So this figure just validates you know, other work, indeed the presence of P53 mutation predicts for poor outcomes. But if we stratify patients on having a higher versus a lower allele burden, either in our Moffitt Cancer Center cohort as well as a validation cohort in King's College, it, indeed patients that have a higher BAF uh, significantly predict for even poor outcomes, where you can see really the only long-term survivors were patients that had an allele burden less than 20%. So is this concordant, uh, you know, with data that we just saw? And I think it, it does. So when we look at P53, it's really, you know, the VAF is strikingly concordant with complex cytogenetics. So around 80 to 100 percent of patients that have a VAF greater than 40 percent will have complex cytogenetics, where about half with lower VAF. And indeed, the median allele burden in patients with complex cytogenetics is significantly higher, both in our, our cohort as well as a validation set. If you look at the absolute number of cytogenetic abnormalities, you see exactly the same thing. The total number of abnormalities is directly dependent on the allele burden of P53. So can you predict for this? So some centers uh, you know, potentially don't you know, have the ability as far as next-gen sequencing, although it's becoming relatively standard in the workup of these patients. But just from cytogenetics, you can predict this. So P53 is, uh, is enriched in patients even with isolated deletion of 5Q, many patients upon rev failure actually have P53 mutation approximately 20% in this cohort. But if you're complex karyotype and have an abnormality of five, you had anywhere between 70 to 100% risk of uh, having a P53 mutation.
So this is great. So we have a lot of prognostic data, but is, can we incorporate this into molecular models of outcomes? And is this dynamic over time? And this is one of the goals of the IWG, which hopefully will be work that will, will come out in the next year or so. But the Cleveland Clinic group did look at this as well. And basically, they developed a computational model where uh, SF3B1 was good, P53 and EZH2 were bad. And they were able to develop a risk score which, which stratified survival nicely. And what the curves on the bottom show, it's a little hard to see, is that this was dynamic. So if you assess this following HMA progression or at subsequent courses in their disease, it was still prognostically relevant, which has not been seen in uh, previous studies. So to comment on, so we know that it impacts prognosis, but can it predict how these patients will respond to treatment? So I would say this area is a little bit of uh, controversy with several groups showing different data. But I think in general, if you have a TET2 mutation in the absence of an ASXL1 mutation, it does predict for uh, response. You know, we have looked at this as well. Again, TET2 muta TET mutant patients without ASXL1 mutations had a very high response rate, whereas none of our co-mutant patients, at least in this uh, cohort, uh, responded that were both TET2 and ASXL1 mutation. And going along with this, the median duration of therapy was significantly longer with this a, uh, uh, genotype. So looking at outcomes to hypomethylating agents, maybe some controversy based on recent data with the cytobine, but in general, multiple groups have shown that P53 patients indeed do significantly poor with hypomethylating agent, although response rates are no different between uh, mutant and wild type groups. But I think more strikingly, the figure on the right as far as outcomes to transplant, this is data from the four large cohorts that have been published, and the only one gene that has been validated in all of them to date is that P53 predicts for poor survival. If you look at the bottom, uh, the, the bottom curve, which is by Sishi Ogawa's group, you know, I think what they show you know, very nicely, indeed P53 is bad, but if you look at the, the blue line, the, the very top line, this is P53 mutant patients that did not have a complex carry type. And based on you know, data, this would be a low allele burden. These patients actually had good long-term survival, um, and potentially you can you know, capture patients if you're able to lower their VAF over the course of treatment, or maybe patients that have a low allele burden at, uh, at, at time of diagnosis. So is this relevant as these patients progress to secondary AML? Um, patients that have a bona fide diagnosis of MDS that progress to secondary AML indeed you know, have poor outcomes of treatment. But what about a patient that has AML with myelodysplastic related change and maybe does not have a previous diagnosis uh, of MDS? And so I think this is nice work by the Dana-Farber group. We're having the presence of, a, of spliceosome mutations as well as ASXL1. Um, B core STAG2 was a ni over 95% concordant with a secondary type uh, leukemia. And so is this relevant? And so indeed it was. Really, these secondary type patients, their response rates to chemo were lower than de novo AML and really exactly the same as patients with bona fide secondary AML. This was also relevant as far as predicting for inferior event free survival. And why is this? So I think as these patients acquire additional mutations, often signaling mutations uh, you know, harbor transformation to AML. And at the time of remission, we're able to clear these sort of rapidly gr gr uh, growing clones. But the background chip or background founding mutations in MDS are often not cleared. And this is perhaps why uh, it predicts for poor outcomes. <laughs> So this is a very nice review that's just published in Nature Review uh, by uh, Ben Ebert and colleagues. And I think you're going to hear about this tomorrow with David Steemsma as far as clonal hematopoiesis. But I think we see from clonal hematopoiesis to MDS to AML, often this acquisition of additional mutations upon progression. But it's somewhat more complicated than that. So work by Andreas Pelagati, they looked at the time of progression from a lower risk MDS to a higher risk MDS or to, um, to AML. And indeed, there are often new mutations picked up, which is highlighted in red. But there's also significantly VAF changes at the time of progression. And at least in this cohort, P53 had been, was increased uh, more so than any other gene at the time of progression. So there's several been several elegant uh, papers published in uh, Nature Genetics and Nature Communications where they did both whole exome sequencing and targeted next-gen sequencing at the time of progression. And clearly the number of mutations increases as patients progress um, as well as the VAF of the dominant clones. But if you look at figure C, it, it's still somewhat heterogeneous. You have patients with mutations that are present in before and after with some patients acquiring new mutations, while other patients, even at the time of progression, losing certain mutations.
And so I think this kind of highlights it nicely. I think the top left shows what we expect. Patient has acquired one mutation, then a signaling mutation with NRAS and progressed to AML. But you can see it's very, very complicated where you can have clonal sweeping or branched hierarchy where some clones can expand, some clones can shrink, all in the setting uh, of changes with treatment or changes in their disease course. So we have recently looked at, is this prognostically relevant? So data this is, uh, that we presented at the International MBS Symposium in Spain, where we have a cohort of 157 patients where they were serial sequenced. Approximately 13% uh, like of the patients uh, became clonally negative, um, but there was a lot of heterogeneity. Some patients picked up a mutation, some lost a mutation, and other patients had stable disease. And we did not see a different number in the median number of mutations uh, in this cohort. And 93% of patients did have treatment uh, between their assessments. So is this relevant on response? So this is looking at hypomethylating agent therapy. And I think what you could see, patients that go into a true CR can have VAF reductions, or in some cases become NGS negative. Again, this was a threshold of 5%. Um, whereas patients that have other response, so let's say hematologic improvement, partial response, or marrow CR, they have no change in the VAF of their mutations. Whereas patients that have no response or progress clearly have an increase. And again, this is st statistically significant, looking CR versus HI plus versus stable disease or disease progression. We see the same thing actually with chemotherapy in this setting. And then looking at transplant, I think as expected, patients that are in remission post-transplant, their mutations go away. And this is relevant, right? Our goal is to cure these patients of disease. Whereas every patient that had relapse post-transplant had the presence of clonal hematopoiesis at the time of relapse. And interesting, if we take a look at the two patients that were NGS positive following transplant, both of these patients um, uh, ultimately relapsed and died of their disease. So is this prognostically relevant? So we, we looked at patients that became NGS negative at, uh, at some time point over the course of treatment. And if you become negative, your prognosis is significantly better. It was not reached in this cohort versus a median survival of only 18 months in patients that were persistently NGS positive. And if we look at the time assessment, actually all patients were still alive who were negative um, at, uh, at last assessment. And we've looked at this in multivariable models accounting for uh, treatment, HMA versus chemo, transplant, um, and this is independent of clinical prognostic scoring systems. And so maybe it can be an early biomarker of response uh, to therapy and can give you, you know, very key insight into a patient's disease. Whereas if we look at patients who gained a mutation, lose a single mutation, or change in their VAF, none of this was prognostically relevant. And this goes with some of the data that was recently published as well. Again, P53 is, is tightly concordant with the clinical trajectory of these patients. So if the clone increases, these patients do worse, but if the clone decreases, um, they can do okay. So in the figure on the left, this is comparing patients that had an allele burden less than 20, that serial, serially over time either decreased or stayed less than 20, versus patients that at any time had a VA of greater than 20%. And the median survival in these patients with the low burden, you know, over time at P53, their median survival was 35 months versus a survival of only 10 months, which is on par with what we expect with P53 mutation. And looking at this as a slightly different way, if they expand, if their clone expands at any time, again, these patients' survival is really cut in half. And again, in multivariable models, is, 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 is clinically significant, independent of treatment and, and, um, and in clinical prognostic models. So with that, I'd like to think I'm fortunate. I have really excellent mentors at Moffitt Cancer Center, Rami Kamraji, who's chairing, uh, chairing this conference, as well as Alan List and Eric Padrone. Um, I'd just like to highlight Shonshak Yoon is a fellow working with me right now on this serial sequencing project. And some of the uh, collaborators that you've seen data from today, uh, including at Genoptics, King's College, uh, the GFM, and uh, I'd like to thank Raf Bahar for several of the slides from the IWG group. And with that, happy to take any questions. Thank you.